Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the last video, we finished setting up the post-process submodule and now we can copy the rendered image of a Mandelbrot fractal from GPass main buffer to the swap chain's back buffer. We didn't get around to handle back buffer resizing, so that's going to be the subject of this video. Today, we are going to improve resizing of windows and implement resize for swap chain back buffers. Remember that we are using render surfaces, which consists of a window and a graphics surface. The user of such a render surface is responsible for detecting any changes in window size and resize the graphics surface accordingly. In our case, the test application is using the render surface, so we use our window message handler to figure out when a window was resized. Because in Windows operating system, there are many ways that lead to some kind of resize message being sent, it's rather hard to come up with a way to determine when a window is done being resized. We only want to resize the surface once, and not while the user is resizing the window using their mouse. We know that anytime a window's size is changed, a WM size message will be sent. So we can set a boolean variable to true when any resizing happens, except when a window is minimized, and later check if the user is not holding down the left mouse button. In that case, we know that the user is done and we can resize the graphics surface. I know we are ignoring the possibility of a user resizing the window using their keyboard, but I can totally live with that. Note that I'm using getAsyncKeyState API function to get the state of the left mouse button. This function sets the most significant bit in its return value if the button is down, which we can simply check by making sure that the return value is equal to or greater than zero. We can get a Windows ID from the Windows user data, look it up in the list of render surfaces and resize the graphic surface that is associated with that window. Note that we also could have used the Windows handle directly to look up the window. When calling surface resize, we are effectively calling a function pointer that points to the low-level implementation of surface resize function. Remember that we didn't implement resize function for our swap chain buffers because I wanted to have something to look at first just to be sure that the resizing happens correctly. And now that we do, we can go ahead and write this function. To resize a swap chain, we first need to release any buffers that are being used as render targets and depth stencil buffers. We don't have any depth stencil buffers, but we do need to release each back buffer resource used as a render target. Note that I'm not freeing any render target views, since we are going to reuse those descriptors after we resize the buffers. To resize the buffers, we call swap chain resize buffers function with the buffer count. Passing 0 for width and height will automatically use the associated windows dimensions and the unknown format will cause the function to recreate the buffers using the same format. We do need to set the flags again. In addition, we need to get the current back buffer index. Finally, we need to create render target descriptors for the resized buffers and that happens in the finalize function. So we just have to call finalize to finish this function. I also add a debug operation that lets me know whenever this function was called, so we can check that it is only called once the window is done resizing. It's not working and I'm trying to figure out why by setting breakpoints. Can you see what's wrong with this block of code? 
The problem is easily fixed once I realize that the break should be inside the if statement. Trying to resize now triggers an assertion failure, which for some reason doesn't break but outright crashes the application. In the output panel, I can see that the failing assertion is in the finalize function, where we check if the size of swap chain buffers is the same as the window size. Inspecting the window dimensions in platform CPP, I see they always contain the same value, even though we have got differently sized windows. So something must be wrong with how resizing is handled here as well. Let's apply the same trick with it in the test application. Here again we add a boolean variable which we set when any window is resized and handle the resizing if resized is true and the left mouse button is not pressed. We can also get rid of other cases that are not working well anyway. To handle resizing, we get a reference to window information and updates either full screen area or client area, depending on whether the window is in full screen mode or not. The application still crashes because our window procedure is getting called by create window X. At this point, however, we haven't yet added a window information structure and therefore we don't have an ID that is needed for resizing. As you can see here, this happens after the window was created successfully. To fix this chicken and egg problem, we can use yet another message to set the ID while the window is being created. The message is wmnc create and it's the very first message that is sent to a window. Here we can add a window info structure and put its ID in the windows user data field. We can also fill in the windows handle. Now, when the internal window proc is called with resize message while being created, we already have an ID and a window info structure for it. After we are done with setting up the window and gathering data in window info, we can update the item in the list of windows which we added in the message handler.
Now we have the correct behavior for resizing and the back buffers are also resized correctly. Notice that there is no pixelation happening anymore. Finally, we can refactor the code for toggling full screen and put it in the block that handles resizing. Therefore, I need a local boolean variable that is set to true when alt enter key combination is pressed. Then if toggle full screen is true, the corresponding window will be toggled. This in turn will also trigger a resize message which will be handled next. I see the resize message appearing twice sometimes, and I think that's because I didn't use parentheses in the if statement. Let's see if using parentheses helps. It seems that it worked, but I am not 100% sure. It is, however, good enough for now. If you know a better way of handling window resizing, then of course I'd be happy to hear from you. Feel free to leave a comment or join the Discord server and make your suggestion. So until now we have been drawing this Mandelbrot fractal, and although it's pretty, there is not much else going on when the application is running. To make it just a bit more interesting, I would like to draw another type of fractal that's closely related to the Mandelbrot fractal. This type of fractal is generally referred to as the Julia set. So let me give a short explanation of how it is related to Mandelbrot fractal. In the last video, we used this fairly simple equation to plot the Mandelbrot fractal. We saw that when we use the xy coordinates of the pixel that we are rendering for the value of c, and choosing 0 as the initial value for z, the equation resulted in z either diverging to infinity or staying within the bounds of the window for the entire number of iterations. Giving different colors to diverging and converging or trapped points makes up the fractal figure. To get the Julia set fractal, we use the same equation, but this time we will take the pixel position as the initial value for z. Remember we always started with z equals 0 for the Mandelbrot fractal. Now, however, we use the x and y pixel coordinates. And c can be any random value on the complex plane, but as we will see shortly, we only get interesting fractals if c remains within the bounds of the Mandelbrot fractal. I found this website by Kyle Miller with the web viewer that I can use to visualize this relationship between Mandelbrot fractal and the Julia set. Here is the point C on the complex plane and as I move it around the resulting Julia set changes accordingly. For our shader animation, I'm going to move around the cardioid shape of the Mandelbrot fractal. I found the formula that describes the path of cardioid on this Wikimedia site. The equation is part of this image, and the meaning of w is down here. Now we are ready to write the Julia set function. Similar to the Mandelbrot function, we need to define the bounds of the Julia set and use them to place it at the center of the window.
Next, we can add the function that evaluates the fractal formula. This time, the initial value for z is the pixel position instead of zero, and c will move around the cardioid of the Mandelbrot shape using the frame number. The rest of the function is pretty much the same. Now we call the Julia set function instead of the Mandelbrot function. Fixing a typo here, and well, I see something here, but it doesn't look quite right. Checking the formula in our function, I see I misplaced a parenthesis. Parentheses are the second most important thing in programming, so never forget to use them if you want to succeed in the games industry. And here it is our fast moving turbo fractal. Obviously, using the frame number is not the best way to set the fractal's animation speed, but we got it working and it looks more interesting because it moves. Speaking of which, looking closely at the moving pixels, I see some jittering going on because we don't use any kind of anti-aliasing. To make it less harsh, we can write a simple implementation of multi-sampling by calculating each pixel multiple times, but each time move them around slightly and then take the average of the sum of those pixel values. Here I define an array of offsets and simply add those to each pixel's position. Like I said, we need to take the average of the sum and not the sum. Now our fractal has a softer look. I'm also not entirely happy with this color palette, so let's play with that a little bit to see if I can get something more pleasing. Yes, that looks better already. Of course, we can also blend color channels in any way we want to get all kinds of interesting color themes. In the previous video, I promised to rewrite the full screen triangle vertex shader without using conditional branching. So let me do that now. We again use the vertex IDs to determine the UV coordinates and then use linear interpolation to compute the positions. I must also disclose that I didn't think of this myself. I don't remember where I got it though. It might be from Direct3D samples or some other engine I studied a couple of years ago. I wasn't able to find it again, so my apologies for not giving credits here. Awesome, the Mandelbrot function also still works, which is great. I can imagine this way of calculating the UV and vertex positions for the full screen triangle can be a bit confusing. 
so I figured I'd give a brief explanation here as well. The first part, which is determining the UV position, is fairly simple. For example, when the vertex ID is 2 and we look at the binary representation of the values, we see that the X component for text is the logical AND of vertex ID and 2, which equals 2. However, for the Y component of text, we shift the bits of vertex ID to the left by 1, which effectively multiplies the vertex ID by 2, and we end up with 4. Logically ending 4 and 2 results in 0, which is clear when we look at the binary notation. So we get 2,0 for text when vertex ID is 2. The second part is calculation of the vertex position using linear interpolation. As you probably know, this is the equation for linear interpolation between two values a and b, with t being between 0 and 1. So at t0 we get c equals a, and at t1 we get c equals b. When t goes from 0 to 1, then we get all values spread equally on the straight line between a and b. The HLSL's intrinsic function lerp does this operation, but apparently it also works with any value of t. When t is less than 0 or larger than 1, the lerp function will do a linear extrapolation. That is, it will give a point c that is before point a or beyond point b. Again, in case of vertex id equals 2, for the x component we have a equals minus 1, b equals 1, and t equals 2. Putting these in the interpolation formula, we see that the resulting value is 3. This way you can compute all position values for each vertex. Let's use the next couple of minutes to tidy up our barriers in the render function. In the previous episode, I talked about split barriers. To demonstrate how they are used, let's split the back buffer barrier which transitions from present to render target state. We can add a new barrier to depth prepass barriers and use the begin only flag which lets the GPU know that the back buffer resource state is about to change. We do the real transition right before post process together with post process barriers. This time we use the end only flag which causes the GPU to really transition the back buffer state. That's it basically, and as you can see, the application works just the same. Let's actually measure the frame rate to see if doing this has any measurable benefits. Okay, let's do a release build without frame rate restrictions, and also let's undo the split barriers for now. I must admit I haven't done any measurement before, so right now I really don't know if this will make any difference for this particular application. This gives us about 350 FPS. I'm just eyeballing this, so it's far from exact. Now let's redo the split barriers, and before measuring again, let's add a few more for maximum effect. Before depth prepass, we can add a begin only transition barrier for main buffer. We can also add an end-only transition barrier for the depth buffer, except for the first time this function is called. That's because there was no begin-only barrier added yet. We can do this by setting a barrier flag that will change to end-only after we called depth prepass barrier function for the first time.
In the GPass transitions, we make the main buffer transition end only, and in post process transition, we add the begin only transition for the next frame's depth prepass. And that's all for now. Let's see if it did anything with the frame rate. I can't really see any major difference, which makes sense because the FPS for fractals is all over the place. We need something that results in more stable frame rates. Let's just fill the screen with a constant color instead. That way we know that the workload has no effect on frame rate. First undo all split barriers for a new baseline. Then modify fill color pixel shader to just output a constant color. Now let's redo the barriers and measure again. And once again, I don't see any noticeable difference. If anything, the FPS seems lower. This is a very premature profiling anyway, since we really don't have a realistic workload yet. It might also depend on your system, so your mileage may vary. And the last thing for today's video is turning on GPU-based validation and see what happens. I'll use conditional compilation because it affects performance a lot and we only want to turn it on when we'd like to check if there is anything that the debug layer alone is not telling us. With GPU-based validation turned on, we get this error saying the GPass depth buffer has an invalid before state. Note that both main and depth buffers are created twice here. That's because we have windows with different sizes, and these buffers need to resize to fit the largest window dimensions. When resizing GPass buffers, we release the buffer resources and create new ones, which effectively resets the state of these resources. That means that we also need to reset the flag that is used in depth prepass barrier function. Resetting the flag got rid of that error. Let's turn off the GPU-based validation. and restore our pretty fractal code. That concludes today's video. As always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time, until then take care and happy game engineering!